Boom. Tales from Macaque Podcast. I got a special uh, episode for you guys today. This is my first swap cast, which means uh, I sat down with a guy who has his own podcast, and that guy today is Mark Tullius. Mark Tullius is a 10th planet purple belt. He is an author, a real live author. He has written uh, some awesome uh, horror books, the most famous one being Bright Side, which is a book I highly recommend it. I, I got a, a copy of it myself. It's pretty dope. It's about all these people who can read minds. He's also working on an MMA book called Unlocking the Cage. He has an Unlocking the Cage podcast where this episode also appears. Uh, and Mark and I, we're working on a project together now. I haven't really spoken about it on the podcast. Maybe I've alluded to it a couple times. But it's called Try Not to Die. It's a new series of... Uh, choose your own adventure stories so you get to the end of a page and it says what do you want to do you want to do this you want to do that and then one of them leads to death one leads to safety so my story it's take place in uh, Chiang Mai a, a city that I spent some time in while traveling my story is about a Muay Thai fighter so the first chapter it's do you want to fight on short notice or do you not <clears throat> one of them leads to certain death and destruction one of them you have the chance for safety uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. At the end, there is a story by Mark Tullius that I think you guys will enjoy. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you guys for joining us. We are here with Marshall Stamper. Yeah. Uh, didn't know we were going to really hang out today. Well, we did. I knew we were going to hang out. Um, wasn't sure if it was actually going to happen, though, because he was driving all the way from <laughs> Vegas. And he's a young kid. You, you never know how those irresponsible young adults can be. Um, but no, he showed up, and we've been talking about trying not to die in 2017. And uh, I'm excited, man. Um, but... You want to go ahead and just do an intro for yours, too? No. Nah. Now that's all fucked up. Tales of Macaque Podcast. Here we are. Mark Tullius. What the fuck, man? What the fuck <laughs> is right? Yeah, man. I drove all the way from Las Vegas today. I um, I spent, like, the past... I don't know how long it was, man. 10, 12 days in Las Vegas. Like, not really planned out. Just brought a bag of clothes and some blankets and some jiu-jitsu gear. And you went out for the fight for, for the first part of it? So that one, I, yeah, for Christmas, my buddy offered to get me a UFC ticket for the Ronda Rousey fight on December 30th. Um, and But the stipulation being I had to drive. So I drove out there for the fight, went straight to 10th Planet. The first day we were there, my buddy Ansel and I went to 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu no. right off there. And then after dinner, I dropped them off at the casino and I went to bed and went back to training in the morning. We saw the fight. I drove all the way back for New Year's. I had a very romantic New Year's, Mark. I, I, I stared up fire all night. Mm -hmm. I built a little fire in my backyard. First time. I've never done this. It's not a, a usual thing for me. Sounds like fun. That's probably that's more than I did. I was probably asleep by midnight <laughs> with the kids. Terrible. Um, but then two days after that, I drove straight back to Vegas. And so how many... You were you were, got a lot of training in, right? Was that why you were doing it? Was the... Went back? Um, it was part of it, man. Yeah, there, it was a big... Uh, 10th Planet Las Vegas is, is cooking up, man. They, they're they hiring a lot of new coaches. My buddy Mike Wilson just started tr coaching out there. Oh, awesome. Um, and I've been in talks with Casey for a while. He, he's always looking for more people to come out there. And I just wanted to go out there and talk to him and honestly get out of my house, man. Like, the holidays kind of made me want to leave. And so I went out there. Like, uh, Yeah, my parents have been texting me. They have no idea what was going on. Left a weird situation. Jake Tullius is back. His drew. Oh, that was so nice. Jake drew me a picture. Um, I don't want to say exactly what it is. I think it's Spider Man. Do you want to tell him what it is? I know. You don't know? It's just beautiful, huh? It's Thanks, really beautiful. Bud. Okay. It's similar to that one I showed him earlier. Jake Jake was looking at my notebook and there's a weird, uh, scraggly drawing that made no sense. I think it scared him as well. Yeah. No, I think it messed with his mind. I was like, <laughs> well, what kind of state of mind was Marshall in when he drew this? Yeah. Um, I dug it. Um, so what, what did we... So, uh, no, dude, the 10th ten, planet, tenth planet, Las Vegas. Um, I haven't been there, but yeah, oh. everything I see, it looks, it looks awesome. And, uh, knowing how it was from Costa Mesa, like I, I was only there a couple of times. Every time I was there, super cool. Yeah. Uh, the level of training between Casey and Ron was awesome. Um, 
And, and now uh, in Vegas, it's Andrew Ram who got his black belt not too long ago. Oh, that's cool. He's coaching and just like dropping knowledge in an uh, unfiltered way. See, that's awesome, man. Yeah. It, it's just amazing. I think that's one thing I'm realizing now is uh, the amount of knowledge that these guys have. I was like, because I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> like, not at all. Not at all. Uh, I'm trying to teach them stuff. I'm like, man, I was like, what do I know? How, how long have you been teaching classes now? Uh, not very long at all. And it was it was just mainly so I could have a date night with my wife. That's how she wanted to spend it, training uh, jiu-jitsu. So she wanted to have another class and no one else would do it. And so that's when I said I would do it. And, and then Anthony said he would do it too. Uh, so it, it's been cool with, with him doing it. But with me, not only am I not that comfortable teaching... Um, but I'm also trying to, I start the class with yoga and like last time we did like 30 minutes of yoga for before like an hour of jits and then like a half hour rolling. Uh, but everyone seems to like it. So <laughs> only you are, uh, doubting your abilities. Everyone else is in yeah. complete agreement. Everyone yeah. else likes it. Yeah. I was like, but I also realized like this is for me too. Um, and, and that's what's cool. Cause I was like, I'm having to learn ahead of time cause I'm watching videos and, uh, I'm like, okay, what can we do? What can I show? What can I try to what do I need to get better at too? Um, so it's definitely, uh, it's been cool. So, but it, what's awesome is Marshall's teaching tonight. So I don't have to do shit. <laughs> um, no, are you, are you good teaching? I don't think so, but I think I, so. I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to try. Dude, you're, you're, you're very knowledgeable. You're, I think your understanding of the game and all that is, and especially after this trip. Um, so I would say that. I would say for sure you have a better understanding, especially of the of the arm bars and spider web that uh, we want to go over tonight than I do. So I say you should teach. All right, man. All right, cool. So I definitely I've known for a while that teaching's in my future. It's yeah. definitely something I want to improve at. But I've had two. I've been in conversation with two different gyms to teach um, in the past fucking three weeks, mm-hmm. and both times that the conversations come up, I have a, a mild panic attack. Like really? my, my heart skips a beat. I go, no way. No. Like, yeah. <laughs> my blood pressure goes crazy and all of a sudden nothing makes sense. Yeah. No. And what, what, what's been cool for me is I, I see that, uh, I think everyone's getting something from the class. So, uh, just a different understanding or like something they didn't see before. And I was like, even if that's minor, if like if, the, if I was able to pass on just that, I was like, then that's cool. Or, or even if I'm just passing on the breathing por- portion of it, um, that Anthony really does. Like, I think that's been one of the biggest things that helped my life recently, like with meditating and everything is the breathing. So I was like, if I'm giving that to those people or at least exposing it to them, uh, exposing them to it, what, you know, what kind of breathing techniques, uh, just the, just the yoga breathing. Um, what, what does that mean? Um, did all the breath is through the nose and trying to match, um, uh, breath for every movement. Um, and then what I, and then when we're relaxing, trying to go deeper and deeper, uh, the exercise I do is just holding my, taking as big of an inhale as possible, holding it, then try to inhale even more through your nose. Now hold it as long as you can, and then inhale some more. And now you're just going to hold until you start to panic. And But just hold it as long as you possibly can. And then when you can't hold it anymore, then just slowly release through your nose. So it just has to be slow. And you're going to expend it all. And then as soon as you think it's empty, hold it. Oh, you're going to be so fucked up. <laughs> he's doing it don't mess up don't mess up keep going out out blow up you got some more in there get out of your stomach now hold it and then expense more hold it and then slowly <laughs> breathe in through your nose as soon as you have to so did your did your hands get tingly at all or anything did you feel anything it's terrifying is it <laughs> well and, and my wife I don't know how much she appreciated the the visualization that I shared with them because I was like look I said this is what I do every time because I've gotten up to um I take those to about a minute and dude after I have like three of those I feel really good um just, I kind of fell off of it a little bit but I think that breathing is awesome totally forget what my point was uh but you should do it so every, everyone <laughs> everyone try it uh Marshall just gave it a shot hopefully uh you got something from it but I'm into uh, it man uh-huh. I've been trying a lot of different breathing techniques, man. Like the the Hicks and Gracie was the first one that I got into mm-hmm. in, in yoga. The breath of fire. Oh yeah. You just exhale rapidly, exhaling to the point that you naturally just create a vacuum and 
air comes in. Yeah. And then obviously the Wim Hof is like the, the most popular one out there that I know. Have but, you have you been doing that? Do you utilize it in your meditation? Like, are you conscious of it, or is it just something that happens now? So uh, when I meditate, it's in the Zen tradition called Zazen, which means just sitting. So when I meditate, I'm just sitting there, and the most I do is I, I count breath, but there's no um, there's no forcing of the breath. And so the the times I do the Wim Hof man is um, usually before I go on stage when I'm doing comedy, because I get so anxious. Um, that it, it calms me down in that way, and also if I'm driving and I'm getting sleepy, it also really helps for that, like especially on a highway. Like I, I, I drove four hours today, um, and I did a couple of times, maybe three times. Really, I started feeling I'm like okay, it's not good, and then hit that breathing and back in it. Yeah, man, I I, I forget about it all the time. Uh, something that was really cool that happened to me the other night, um. I was pumped because Jen took the kids somewhere or I forget what happened, but I had the house to myself. I was like, I could fall right into writing right now. I went right to my computer. I was doing really good. And I was, I was grateful for her. I was like, okay, I'm focused. I'm, I was like, but no one was like, and for some reason I got, I think it was the, the gratefulness thinking got me thinking about mindfulness and breathing. I remember I was like, oh, I'm not even breathing. I was like, well, no, I haven't even taken like a couple minutes to meditate today. I was like, I should, like if I'm telling other people, they should do it. And so I started doing it right there, sitting sitting at the table. I was like, ah, you know what, just lay down and do this. <laughs> and I ended up doing, uh, so I was like, I'm going to breathe for five minutes. I ended up turning into like an awesome little yoga session. And it was like, I was so much better for it. Then I went right back to work. Like I was afraid maybe I wouldn't fall back into work. But I was probably just that much more focused and that much more, I don't know. I was in a, in a much better place. What, what does it look like when you meditate? Um, sitting on the floor uh generally i'll just go on my sometimes i'll sit up uh when i did a real deep one i think i told you about dude i haven't done another one like that since Uh, (laughs) (laughs) yeah so that's all your fault you you ruined that shit um yeah it's generally just uh laying on my back and doing the deep breathing that way um but you know yeah maybe this talk will get me focused more on uh getting back into that kind of meditating because i i don't do it uh and just but just that little bit and maybe I think the yoga really is where I do a lot of the meditation or whatever. If I'm getting in an hour of that, I, I've been trying to get like an hour a day. Um, it doesn't always happen, but... Yeah, traditionally, man, uh, the purpose of yoga was so that you can sit better in meditation. So if you're really into yoga, um, the best time to meditate be like right when you're done. You know what oh, I mean? Just, okay. just right then strike a, a pose. You, the, the full lotus is like the most, the best one for your spine. A lot mm-hmm. of people can't do full lotus. Next better is a half lotus. Some people can't do half lotus. The idea is just to get like your knees level and your, um, below your hips. Mm-hmm. So if you have to sit on something, raise your hips up, get comfortable. And after yoga is the time that you can uh, do that the easiest. Yeah. I'm realizing uh, like I'm still not able to do that. But my flexibility has improved so much, and like, and that's what I tell everyone. Dude, else. You're I was ridiculous. Like, I, I, I was like, no, I was like, you can't. Uh, I've seen you do some shit, man. Yeah, I was like, I was like, I was like, think about how limited you are. I said, okay, I couldn't touch my toes, so I was like, how could I do this move? You know, how long like, ago could you not touch your toes? Um, dude, probably a year and a half. I don't know. A year and a half ago. And now you're Maybe. touching your toes like over your head when you're laying down. Yeah, yeah. I get my knees behind <laughs> my uh, knees behind my almost my almost to the mat. I want to be able to be unstackable. And then wow. I've been working on a full stretch too. I'm not there yet, um, but I was like, you know what? That's probably possible this year. And last year, I asked Anthony that. I was like, hey man, so with my age, I was like, do you think it's possible that I could even get into a full stretch, like a full split? And he's like, he wasn't very optimistic. <laughs> um, and who knows? And but, has all your yoga been with Anthony? Like, uh, we... No, I should. Uh, it started out just with videos here because I do. I've seen what my it did for my dad. My dad's like seventy, and my mom. Um, but my dad's seventy or so, and he was doing like a handstand off my diving board. I'm like, <laughs> oh man, and he just seemed like he could do all kinds of crazy stuff, <laughs> and he wasn't like that before. So it pretty much, it, I'm sure it's extended his life like crazy. Uh, same with my mom. Um, then my sister's really into it. And so I just started doing videos downstairs. I would lock the, I'd make sure no one can see. I'd close <laughs> the door so Jen wouldn't come in. And uh, yeah, it's it's crazy what kind of stigma there was, you know, or like what kind of, but that's why I tell, and that's why I think it's good for me to teach, if I'm teaching it or there for Anthony to point to, it's like, look, 
if I could do it, you know, I think I think it makes it a little bit easier for guys to do it if they walk into a class and I'm doing it or if Anthony's yeah, doing yeah. it, you know, compared to like a, a real, like someone that was like a real little guy or a feminine or whatever else. Dude, that, like, that's why no one believes me when I tell them they can do yoga. Yeah. Because like I, I, I said, like I've always been able to sit in full lotus. Really? Like that, that's a, that's a rare thing. And so people see that. And, <laughs> and so um, it's just a strange thing, man. Like comparing yourself to that teacher, it is helpful when there's someone like you who mm-hmm. is more relatable. Because a lot of people get that in their idea that they have to like get up to you. It's like if you're teaching me how to lift weights, I'd be like, dude, there's no way I can get as big as you. There's yeah. no way. Yeah, you could. But that, that's the false mentality, man. Like, oh, no, so no. You, like you, you to could myself. <laughs> I would need steroids and, um, I don't know, a couple inches. Yeah, <laughs> dude, I, I, I used to be all about that. But I'm trying to break that, man. Now I want to get to where my body should be. So I'm trying to cut out the cut out the sugars. And like my, my diet's pretty good, but I was like, why not, why not make it even better? Mm. Um but those kinds of thoughts make me think about too. Is like, well, do I really care? Like, how much do I care about being in better shape? Because if I really cared about being in better shape, I would be downstairs. You see all the equipment I have. Yeah, I you could, have full mats. Oh, oh, I every could weightlifting thing I've ever seen. Yeah, there's a, <laughs> there's a pull up bar. There's a, that uh, the shaker machine. I have the sauna. I use the sauna all the time. Um, you have a sauna? Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the infrared one, dude. That's awesome for inflammation, dude. Yeah. I tell everyone. Uh, yeah, I swear by that thing. <laughs> but uh, Mark, this is why I love coming over, man. You have like the most amount of things of anyone I know, and like I'm a big proponent of having less things. Like that's how I've been living my life. Like I have very few. Like my everything I own is in my car. That's what I told you earlier. It's not a far stretch. Yeah. Like most of my stuff is like this tea, and I have my own podcast gear and. I have some books, <laughs> some clothes, but then I come here and you have like the dopest stuff. Like I love it so much. It's no. so great. <laughs> no, that's cool, man. Uh, but you know what? And this is what I tell Anthony, dude, I was, I was exactly where you were. Um, uh, yeah. I start the book unlocking the cage, uh, with me being in that place where I lived in a little studio apartment and dude, for a while I was at my mom's back and forth and dude, I, I had nothing. I was eating like shit just cause it was cheap. Um, so uh, and not to say that's where you're at, but <laughs> that's where I think when s- s- some people see me or, or whatever, they're like, oh, this dude had this, like, no, like bankrupt. Uh, you, well, you know, other stuff in my past, but uh, Wait, when, yeah. when did you go bankrupt? How old were you? Uh, that was late. I do. I, I held it off for a while. I should have gone bankrupt before, um, or with my first marriage, but <laughs> I, I didn't, um, that would have been smarter, but I, cause I had all kinds of like debt collectors and so, but I paid them whatever half and then they leave you alone type thing. So like I was in trouble before. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, dude, credit cards are evil and especially yeah, with my kind, of, my kind of personality and, well, <laughs> and, and my, and my ex-wife. Um, <laughs> yeah. So some of it was my fault. Man, you were telling me a crazy story outside. What, <laughs> what do you say? You moved to Vegas to be a pro boxer at what, what, what age? Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> I was thinking about this too. I don't like talking about. I don't like saying I was a fighter because I was, dude. I was a terrible one. So, <laughs> but I don't. I don't think. But ballsy, like the enthusiasm. Yeah, I yeah. It. Oh, I had enthusiasm. I, that the enthusiasm was there, or just reckless behavior. Well, man, like, or, I, I'd love to hear more about like what what happened. Like so. All right. <laughs> So after Brown, how'd your first fight go? Uh, <laughs> I broke my. All right, so I had. I was telling. I was telling Marshall that. Um, so I had messed around with some uh, no holds barred uh, MMA, trying to do it here. Uh, I think my last fight was against Tim Lasik, and uh, that's right when I was making the switch to try to box. Oh, I just remembered. I was trying to. I learned. I was. I went to a pro boxing coach. Because I took a fight um, against a Russian champion that was going to kill me in a <laughs> in a no holds uh, in a no glove uh, boxing match, I'll call Primal Fury. And, uh, they, <laughs> well, what what year is this? This is nineteen ninety eight, I think. Wow. And I just yeah, I had the paperwork here. Uh, Five years after MMA was and so in I, America, I, I, I had to lie about my record. Um, so my coach lied about my record. Um, he got me this fight because dude, I was a big dude I was, and I was stupid on fighting like. I just didn't care. Um, dude, I was also supposed to be going into the Marines, I think, too, at that time. Uh, <laughs> so I just didn't give a fuck. Um, and, uh, it, yeah, it was uh, it was a crazy time. But So that's why I started going there. So I, ended up, I went to a press conference. They flew me out for this uh, the Primal Fury uh, press conference ahead of time or like a media teaser. Um, everything was set to go. I was going to get destroyed, and then the fight fell through. Thank really? God. Oh, thank God. But Wait, I was gonna, well, I was going to do it. The guy got injured or No, no, the whole event. Um I think <laughs> <laughs> they decided it's illegal. Yeah. yeah. Like, 
do it in Alabama. Like it was Mobile, Alabama. Like they really? and everything goes there, but they even there, they're like, nope, not this one. So, <laughs> but dude, I, I was just happy about it. Uh, <laughs> you dodged such a bullet, man. So a Russian savage in Mobile, Alabama, with what you bare knuckles? Yeah, yeah, bare knuckle boxing. Um, I was, <laughs> but in my head, I was like, oh, I'm a strong guy. I could throw a hard punch. One punch, break whatever. your hand with one punch. Yeah, oh, dude, and this guy shit. was like, this guy was like a champion and, and teaching their army all kinds of special forces. Like a sambo guy. Oh yeah, I was gonna so get you gonna snap your leg. Yeah, I was gonna be. <laughs> um, but so from there, my the boxing coach convinces me. He's like, hey, you can make a lot more money boxing than MMA. Oh. Let's just turn you a pro boxer. And I'm trusting him and thinking, all right, yeah, if you see, it. and he's like looking at me, got a great white hope. Uh, and 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 i see that okay if i if i could be decent i could be like if they if i was managed the right way and if i actually had some skills or whatever but dude the problem was uh one i jump into fighting right away i i had uh eight rounds maybe six to eight rounds of like bullshit sparring against a teammate before my first pro fight <laughs> like that was the only i had some training i hit no, the heavy bag i could hit the heavy bag you basically did nothing yeah so <laughs> so i in, in that fight i broke my um broke my knuckle in the first round i think it, it went four rounds and it wasn't that bad of a break this is what big gloves on yeah and that wouldn't have been an excuse uh that's not an excuse like i probably would have lost that duty now so that was the decision and then i was convinced to move to vegas to uh where they would you know raised me the right way and i have experience and that guy's a spar against all the time um and i went down there i moved to vegas for that and holy shit dude i was going down to like the johnny tocos or whatever it's called one of the main gyms down there and being put against guys that were like 13 and oh uh heavyweights <laughs> and just fucking me up dude like really bad how, how big were you back then uh i was like probably 245 250 anywhere from Anywhere from like 225 was like the skinniest, which is kind of where I'm at now. I'm at 220, um, up to up to 275. Holy shit! Yeah, but I was just big and out of shape and um, hitting hard. Yeah, and and, and <laughs> it didn't even hit hard. Like you know, I was just uh, I fought for all the wrong reasons, dude. I, uh, <laughs> but the the only good that came out of it, dude, I wouldn't have done this book if I uh, if I hadn't fought. I wouldn't have wondered, you know, had this question that I wanted to answer, and. Uh, so what, what, it's been, it's what been was cool. that question? Uh, why the fuck did I do it? <laughs> yeah, like, because everyone would always ask me, like, why, why do you fight? You know, why would you, yeah. why would you fight? Especially coming from, if I just heard someone else's story and I didn't know anything else, if I was like, oh, this guy just got out of the Ivy League, graduated from Ivy League, never really fought in his life, um, but he's starting to fight. And this is, remember, this is twenty, what, fucking ninety eight, almost twenty years ago. So that's <laughs> a long time MMA, ago. I mean, it was not as mainstream as it is now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not yeah. even close. Yeah, so no one's really knowing about a, it. Not an accepted career path. Yeah, very shady. <laughs> so it's hard to explain Super to your parents. Shady. Yeah, and taking off time for work and trying to work, trying to get your work schedule. Like I would work uh, graveyards all the time, uh, so I could train. What, what what job was that? Uh, I well, I, <laughs> I bounced a lot, different places. Um, do tons of different places but then also uh bodyguarded and when i was in vegas i was mainly doing the working at a uh, prison i was a correctional officer wow. and then also a juvenile probation officer and i like the juvenile probation officer was actually kind of cool so not super cool but <laughs> i mean i gotta yeah I hear some fucked up stories but uh the, the saddest thing about that was you want to make a difference in kids' lives, and then you see their parents come, or maybe never, never come on mm-hmm. a visiting. And you're like, you know, it's like that's how, how you know. Of course, the kid is is here. Yeah. Like look at look at this person. I, I noticed that exactly. It's the same principle in a much nicer setting. When I was teaching kindergarten in Taiwan, all the nice kids had really nice parents. All the terrible kids had parents who were late and yelling at them. And mm-hmm. yeah, Dude, that's crazy. I, I uh, I always wonder how other parents think about me uh, when, I, <laughs> when I go because I realized I was like man I was like I'm one of those like uh, preschool mom I don't know if they call preschool moms but uh, <laughs> <What>? <laughs> like like what I was you like do? like a mom that would drop off her kid in her PJs in the morning oh, and yeah, then yeah. when she picks them up in the afternoon she's still wearing those same clothes oh. <laughs> like I, I, I'm That's one what of, you do? I'm one of those people um although the other day i wore a slayer shirt in there and i didn't realize it until afterwards that everyone was kind of looking at me a little bit different <laughs> and then i saw my shirt afterwards like oh that could be it <laughs> so but no i'm sure you've been standing out in crowds for a long time yeah probably <laughs> maybe 
I, I, I never saw that. And that's something that Anthony says too. Like I never, I always see myself as the same as everyone else. Hmm. But, um, but it's like, no, I look like a skinhead. Big skinhead. <laughs> no. Take white dude with a goofy grin. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jake just asked me to grow my hair. He's like, cause he saw a picture of me with hair. He's like, yeah, you should grow your hair. I'm like, Mm, I don't think that's going to happen, dude. <laughs> this isn't by choice. <laughs> uh, hey, hand me that cup, man. I'll fill you some more tea. Oh, like, thank you. What what kind of tea is this? This is Taiwanese black tea. Oh, dude, I'm the, allergic. The Sun Moon Lake. That's awesome. So tea is your thing, right? It's one of them. It's something I like a lot. What? Uh, when when do you get into that? In college. Um, my roommate's Thanks. brother was uh, really into it, and he started selling it. And, um, yeah, so it just became around. And then that year I discovered the Mad Monk Tea Shop in San Diego, a very strange place where a man who was not much older than me, he's like two or three years older than me, he looks just like me, but he <laughs> he just sits there all day and just pours tea, which is the, the traditional way of a Chinese tea shop is a man sits at a desk, with a bunch of tea surrounding him and he sits there and drinks all day and if you want to come join him you can just drink for free like there's no uh discussion of price or anything and you can just sit there and this guy would just like tell me like crazy shit like all this philosophy he was reading and all these things and then from there I, I drink tea almost every day and then um I moved to Taiwan which is uh probably the best island in the world for tea like, tea originally comes from China, and when the communists took over China, all the best parts of China got squeezed out into Taiwan. That's the simplified version of how dope Taiwan is. And so when I was there, man, like, it was just surrounded by all this great tea, and then I got a job where I could drink tea for three hours a day. In the morning, every day, I'd just sit at, the, sit at my desk, usually with a notebook, sometimes with a Joe Rogan podcast, mm-hmm. and just drink tea, and it's like the most... Um, like the healthiest meditative hobby that I can think of. Really? Yeah. What, what does there. it? What does it? What does it give you? Um, I mean, in the most basic way, man, it, it's hydrating as fuck. Like it's yeah. a, which is like it's such an overlooked thing in like in health. Yeah. I like, sitting there. I drink like in right here. We're gonna drink. Um, I don't know whatever a whole kettle of water is. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot. But then, like, this tea in particular, man, it's just really, like, well-grown and organic and uh, really old, old farms. And so the effect of it, like, I don't even know how... I, I sound like an idiot when I talk about it. It's going to sound really dumb. I don't know, like, the scientific compounds oh, of dude. tea. But in either. Chinese, what they say is that it has qi. Qi being, like, the energy of nature, of the universe. Just so how do they energy in the that? simplest way. That's cool. Yeah, so these leaves are just well picked and well maintained. I don't know exactly what's going on, but there's a, a good feeling that comes with it. Now, with uh, with chi, with, with your meditation, do you? Maybe I even asked you this. Um, do you, can you feel chi and like can you move it in your body? Can you circulate it? Like do you or do you like or let's say at least use that in your visualizations? Like has that been any part of your meditation? Um, it, it's something I can feel, but it, I don't. I don't think about it too much. Can you shoot a fireball? <laughs> no. I was like, because that's what I want to. That's what I but wanted to do. I, I did have an experience once, man, when I was sitting on a rock in Joshua Tree on um, a mushroom tea. I had a teapot just like this one with the the container in there, and I, I put mushrooms in it with some tea. And then I sat on this rock and closed my eyes and had my palms face up and I could see lightning coming out of them and I could feel it That's dope. because I've done, I did three meditation retreats last year, lasting for a week each. And on, and all of them kind of follow a similar, similar pattern for three days. I sit there and not much is happening and I start doubting and get down on myself and my mind's going crazy. Then on the fourth day, uh, my mind settles down and I can feel um, like vibrations through my hands. I don't know. I don't know another way to say it. I th- I think that's what they mean by chi. Like, yeah. Where the fuck that is? Whether it's just this is something that's always happening, and my mind is settled, and now I just notice it because mm-hmm. that's a real thing. Like in vipassana meditation, you sit there for three days and just follow your breath. They they say is just look at the area right below your nostrils and your upper lip. Every breath you take stimulates that area, but usually you can't notice. Right right now I'm talking, so there's mm-hmm. no way I can notice that as well. Like that's just too many things for our brain. Mm-hmm. But if you're doing nothing else and you can and you can't feel it, that means there's a lot of activity going on. 
by the time you can feel it, your brain is naturally settled. If you keep following that, you're going to get bored and it goes off again. And okay. then you keep feeling it and it brings it back and it goes off and you rein it back in and it goes off and you rein it back in. Mm -hmm. And it's that um, pattern is what you're trying to develop. That pattern of reining in the brain when it's going off. Because it's going to keep going, man. Like there's no, there's no, no one in existence is a completely reined in brain, but it's a good goal. Now, do you have a hard time at all devoting a week or uh, a day or an hour or even like 20 minutes to meditating or like is it do you get enough from each of those experiences to where yeah this is a part of my life i want to i'm going to continue to do this yeah so um this has been a goal of mine for like five years now i in college i started learning about buddhism and i, I met uh the sensei who i've gone on these meditation retreats with she was my teacher she's been on the podcast a couple of times sensei annie piricello and she's just, uh, she just kept always stressing that meditation's um, a positive thing. She wouldn't really mm -hmm. go into detail. She didn't really say why. Just, just, it was always just very understood. She said it with confidence so many times. Mm -hmm. So for years, I, I wouldn't really take her seriously. I'd meditate once a week. I would <laughs> meditate once a month when stoned. I'm not taking her really seriously. But even to this day, man, I've been doing it for a long time. And the hardest place to meditate is home by yourself. Mm -hmm. that's because there's so many other possibilities you know especially i'm sure for you man you have all these toys in this house you have all these projects you're always doing a million things it's yeah. so easy when you're uh by yourself to just do something else mm -hmm. masturbation is always easier than meditation that's like, it's true. always an, always a simpler option after reading uh what was that book fuck um with resistance it was a we just i talked about it recently but he talks about all the things that are resistance to uh, the our, our, our yeah, 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 our creativity. But masturbation yeah. was one of them. So I was, oh, like, yeah. I was like, every time I get that urge, I was like, no, that's fucking resistance. <laughs> Hands off. <laughs> get the work, motherfucker. Dude, I, I procrastinate like crazy. Yeah, uh, what's your favorite way? Uh, procrastinating? Guitar? Uh, yeah. So maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll, we'll see your input on that because... Um, I don't know. I, I, I want to justify it. Uh, yeah. But I, I get the, the emails from a musician. I've been using the musician app. Um, and it shows you exactly how long you've been playing. <laughs> and I had a, I, I was concerned like last week. It was four, four and a half hours plus some, some Rocksmith. Uh, and this week it was like five, a little over five hours. Um, but man, I'm, I'm enjoying it. And I just, I want to do it. I'm, I'm seeing myself improving. Like I'm still awful. But I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing improvement. And... I think I don't know my my do my brain scores. I don't know if it's related, but my brain game Lumosity scores are like the biggest jump I've had since I've I've been playing just about. Oh. So I don't know if it's the, I don't know if it's the music or I'm I'm doing different things or what. Or I'm sure it's a combination of everything. Yeah, that, but, that makes sense, man. I, one thing that I really uh, want to research more and what I've been hearing a lot about is, is flow states and the benefits thereof. Like there's a guy Stephen Colt Coltler. Col Col I don't know. Coltler, maybe. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, and he was talking about how he was very, very sick, and then he went surfing one day, and the excitement of that surf trip pulled him out of this uh, disease, and then from then on, he went to go study it. And flow state is this that feeling of total immersement in something um, that you think is just outside of your skill level. Mm -hmm. it, it's treading that line between something you you think you can't do, but oh shit, I'm doing it. It's that kind of uh, excitement and. What he says and what Jason Silva has been saying for a long time is that getting that um, transfers into everything. You know, so if you get that with guitar, which I, it sounds very easy for you to do, mm -hmm. uh, it's a simple uh, tool to get there. Uh, yoga being another one, jujitsu being a huge one, but needing more people usually. Mm -hmm. um, and once you have that, you can transfer in anything. So for, for you, it's a writing, I'm sure. That's when you need it the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is how often do you write, man? Are you, do you write every day? Uh, you're no, like a real I, author, man. I, 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 dude, I, I still don't. Con it's hard to consider myself a real author. <laughs> I, I, I don't feel like I should be. Everyone's like, "Hey, you don't look like one." It's like, yeah, I'm don't sitting feel here like and one. I see your book. So, oh, that that's, that's true. I, 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 <laughs> I, and the, the thing that that's the thing I have to go back to. I, I I go back to reviews. I was like, even though it's not highly highly reviewed, that's what I look at when I when I doubt myself. I'm like, okay, there are people that like this stuff a lot. Yeah, so, man. But it's Dude, uh, it's hard, man. That that inner voice. We we, we, <laughs> we criticize the fuck out of ourselves. Yeah, I don't think that's going away, man. But I, I was I was quite surprised, man. I looked up Brightside on the Kindle app um, 
not expecting much. <laughs> you got some, uh, you got some stars, man. Thank you. Thank I, you. I don't want to quote you wrong, but they're up there. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a, uh, I think a four point one, and we're at ninety eight. I was like, because over a hundred, I think Amazon starts helping you out a little bit. Um, Cause, dude, as an indie author, especially if you don't do marketing, who's going to discover you? But what's awesome is, dude, uh, things are in the right direction. But the most important thing, having fucking fun. Like this year, dude, doing the. What, what what's your take on the try not to die? Uh, do you think I'm being overly ambitious by doing all these books? Like, I think Man. I think I'm just gonna. I want to be the driving force and help these people create awesome things. Yeah, man. Um, I don't know about being overly ambitious. It's it's, it's very ambitious. You're putting out, uh, giving all these uh, new authors opportunities, which is cool. But yeah, but dude, uh, what I'm already getting from the different ways you guys are thinking about stuff, I'm already getting like the series is going to be that much better. There's no way I could duplicate. Uh, like I could come up with a decent amount of stories, but how many of my stories are actually going to develop into something good um, by working with all the you and all these different people? I was like, man, you're just unique individuals that are thinking about something with your own passions. And then if I could just help try to maybe mold or direct that, I was like, then that's awesome. And you could see too, like, how do you feel? Does it feel like it's flowing naturally to you? Do you, do you are you hitting that state with the writing? Man, the, when we first started talking about this, and you told me I could do a, a choose your own adventure story where people are dying and stuff, I instantly knew it had to be in Chiang Mai, just because like that's a city I think about all the time, and like. It's a bit dangerous, a bit seedy. There's Muay Thai going on, which is like a fun way to kill someone. Um, so initially, man, the story just came out of me. Like almost everything that we talked about today, I figured out in the first couple weeks. And then luckily for me, man, I, I was thinking about it a lot during my Vipassana retreat, my, my meditation retreat at the beginning of December. And so that really just solidified everything. But since then, <laughs> I haven't uh, typed up much. I haven't had that next step process. Because the holidays were, were rough for me, man. Yeah. And what's awesome, dude, all that shit is right there. Not only did yeah. you write it down, but you already, I, I think we work a lot, a lot alike where you're kind of, you're seeing these things too, right? Do you see them in your head? Like, yeah, what, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and from the way you answered all these questions today and before, it's like you already know this character. You know what's happening. You know all the dynamics. You're making cool decisions. Like... I don't gotta do shit. So when it comes, I, was like, I was like, "That's awesome." I was like, and, "And I get the the higher percentage." I was like, "Fuck yeah for me!" Um, and and uh, and whatever. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. Well, I've been really surprised at the responses from everybody. Like, there's some people that are pretty excited about this because um, you never know how someone like who wants to really write a book. And that seems like kind of a nerdy thing to do, or <laughs> or, or people are busy, especially fighters and stuff. The way I think of it, man, is I think, um, at least for me, like the bigger concern is like, am I worthy to write a book? Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that has to weigh on other people as well. Yeah. Cause yeah. it seems like a lofty proposition. Yeah. I, I like to crush that in people, dude. That's when, that was one of the cool things. Um, I think because my friends helped me do that with unlocking the cage. Cause dude, I wasn't going to do this, uh, go around the country and interview people. I don't want to leave my fucking house, uh, <laughs> especially being a terrible fighter and never interviewing anyone. So, dude, I was a 40 year old dude or almost. Um, and just it wouldn't happen if I didn't have friends that were saying, no, you can do this. Why couldn't you do this? Um, you know, and but I know that feeling with the author thing. It's hard saying you're an author, but we're going to write a fucking book and then we're going to put it out and then you're an author. So. <laughs> Done. That's why I try to explain uh, coming to jujitsu to my friends. Yeah. Like, no, do I it. don't do that. I'm like, yeah, but if you came once, then it, you you did it yeah and um yeah it's just it's just the brain keeps doing that man that, i think that's always time on the art of war or war of art war yeah of art. <laughs> no but i think uh yeah and, and you needed that like how important was that time uh and, and I, ever since i adopted that philosophy of like eh, it'll happen when it happens mm. like when it happens that's the right time uh dude that's how i'm taking on all these different authors and these ideas, I was like, not everyone's going to hit me at the same time. And then whoever hits me first, like, we'll work on that. And I'll be able to go back and forth. But uh, I'm not going to worry about, like, if book two finishes on book five. Or let everyone go at their own pace. It will all happen. Um, when Unlocking the Cage comes out, that's the right time. When it's like, I don't know, man. Just the less stress. Like, I'm not going to get stressed over shit. I mean, well, that's what I tell myself. And then I, <laughs> then I get stressed and I have to go breathe. And I'm like, okay, remember, motherfucker, you said you weren't going to get stressed about shit. That's the raining the brain back in. Yeah. It's, it's good. Was there a time when you were a lot worse about that? Like the stress and all that? Oh, dude. Not handling it well? Dude. Uh, here, look at that picture. Um, you see that one over there? The boxing one? That, 
angry, That's you? angry young man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a boxing picture of hitting the heavy bag with an angry face. Um, yeah, man. So how old are you in that picture? That picture, I'm probably like 26, I guess. So you're 26 there. And when did you put out your first book? Uh, not until Brightside, which was right when I started unlocking the cage, which was 2012. So like almost, it will almost be five years. Whoa. Yeah. So, and I was on, dude, if it wasn't for unlocking the cage, I would have been flying with books. Um, but everything's been kind of on hold. Uh. Yeah, all, dude, all these are individual files, like different books I should be writing. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. One of I'm them, looking at a collection of about a uh, thousand book opportunities. <laughs> this one this Jesus one right Christ, here, is, <laughs> this one's a hundred thousand words. It's, it's just about finished. I just need to work on it for like maybe a month or two. And I could be done. But it's been sitting there for like two years. So I've been stuck on unlock. And like I have to tell myself at times like I got to stay on one thing because it's, it's so tempting to go back and forth. But mm. that one is, uh, I'm going to mix that one in with the Try Not to Dies and try to get that out hopefully by next year. Maybe this year. But Ain't No Messiah <laughs> writing about the Son of God. Yeah? Uh, no. I, well, who knows? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know if he is either, but there's some interesting stuff that happens with him. Uh, and then that allows me to do uh, Try Not to Die as the Messiah because I'll be talking about him. So then it's not as inflammatory and I don't get death threats, hopefully. Yeah, man. The way you described that to me, uh, just having a, a story about Jesus and you have to choose his path so he doesn't die. That's a, that's controversial, man. That's oh <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if we're going to do that one. Um, I, I would, I would do it. If people wouldn't get upset, if people saw it as like, it's just a, I don't know. We'll drop it. Cause I'm, Pe- people like to get upset. Yeah. People get upset. <laughs> Dude. Um, that's one thing. One of the books, I don't know if I told you about it or not, but, and you probably don't need it, but if anyone else wants to check it out, uh, the biology of belief, but I think mm. it's Bruce, Dr. Bruce Lipton, uh, but that really made me think about how many of our beliefs aren't really our beliefs. Like they were just, they're our parents' beliefs or whoever, oh, yeah, like, especially yeah, before yeah. the age of like six. Oh, definitely. And, and just how we get, and being more aware of how you're set off by, like how I would be set off by certain things. Like, okay, what? why am I so upset about this? Mm. Oh, it's because it was about religion. And I still believe this and this and this. Like, um, you know, and just those deep-seated beliefs. Um, but it was interesting. Yeah, so man, that, that kind of helped me change too a little bit. That um, with the way you just described that, that that's the exact process that I was thinking about uh, at on meditation retreats. The most recent one, I was thinking about my dad almost the entire time, and the conclusion that I came to, man, is that I have inherited all my dad's bad habits. Like almost everything that I don't like about what I do, I see exactly in that man. Which is like why I feel very fortunate that I've been uh, living with him for the past nine months. Because for seven years before that, I didn't see him much. Okay. I had forgotten that we're, we're the same, the same uh, person basically. I mean, yeah. like, to put it simply, but it, yeah, man, that, I, I think about that all the time. No, yeah, I, I, I definitely, I think the same, same exact thing. Do you um, see that in your children? What's that? You see that in your children? Things um, that you don't like in yourself? Um, not yet, but I'm sure I will. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah defiance and everything else and I think yeah, jake's I, gonna get tattoos and hit a bag screaming he probably will <laughs> yeah. odds are yeah, yeah. no but I it's think, interesting I think that, so. that he uh he's seen you like post yoga you know what i mean like you're telling yeah. me like it, it's changed a lot in you and how you're uh you weren't doing these breathing techniques 10 mm-hmm. years ago it sounds like yeah no at not time, at all. he'll never know you yeah yeah um, not not at all dude i was i was in bad shape but yeah now He'll do the yoga with us. He'll he'll do the breathing if he's having trouble sleeping at night. Really? And, yeah. Wow. So it's cool. It, and uh, how old is three? He's three and a half. <laughs> he's and, three and uh, a half doing yoga breathing techniques. Yeah. So he's I mean he's been because he just he, you know when Anthony was coming over here just or even if I was just by myself I would do that and I would just watch him while I'm doing yoga and so it just he picks uh, it up. Yeah. Yeah. If Daddy's doing it, um, and now his movement. And he also did some jits, but. Um, with Coach John, but yeah, his just ability to move and everything is awesome. Yeah. So, uh, I got to push him harder on the yoga. I want him doing handstands by next year. <laughs> a little lazy fucker. Dude, I used to teach a class of uh, kids like the same size, the same age, like uh, they're three to four. I'd teach them once a week in Taiwan. And my favorite thing is I just have them do jump squats. Really? I tell them, touch the floor, touch the sky, touch the, like, just for 10 minutes at a time. Just until they pass out? Like, yeah, until they, they, they stop laughing, and then we sit down, and then get back to whatever um, bullshit story I was supposed to read, or... Kid, <laughs> the kids, curriculum there was pretty simple. Kid, kids are fun. 
<laughs> so that was your job you were teaching? Is that Yeah, that... I taught I taught English in Taipei for about a year and a half. Wow. Yeah, training jiu jitsu the whole time. Um that's where I started doing comedy. I was I was teaching English sixteen hours a week. I, I started work at two in the afternoon. <laughs> Worked I had Tuesdays off, had weekends off. And did they even know if you were telling them the right stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The English is pretty prevalent. Oh, okay. A, every class has a, a co teacher who's just an underpaid Taiwanese woman. And I'm just an overpaid white man. Oh, like, okay. that's the dynamic in every classroom. <laughs> I didn't know if you were fucking up everyone's spelling and stuff. No, no, no. I'm pretty good. <laughs> my, 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 my English is pretty good. <laughs> Dude, I, 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 could not, uh, I couldn't teach an English class. No way. Like, um, uh, my, my wife asked me something about Libby's homework the other day, like the part of speech. I'm like, fuck, I don't know. Yeah. I was like, eh, whatever. That's a good thing about you, man. Like, authors like you probably couldn't have existed back in the day because now you have spell check and all these yep. things. I'm sure massive in your life. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, good editors. I, do, I think I'm one of the last, like, like my generation of the last people who didn't learn how to type, like, on spell check. Like, mm-hmm. I think, like, now that's just automatic. Yeah, yeah. The kids have phones and computers that are just like automatically correcting them. Yep. Yeah. No, no need for spelling anymore. Um, although, yeah, if you were to have to actually spell something out and it's all fucked up, you yeah, just look like happens. a moron. I never had to spell something. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> they ask me spelling questions. I, I, just, I wish they would, man. I'm pretty good at spelling. I, <laughs> I studied I, hard. I, I'm pretty decent. Um, <laughs> there's something I was going to ask you. Oh, so what do you think about... Um, do you have any goals in mind? Because definitely not deadlines, and I don't care. But when are you seeing, when do you think maybe we would have a good draft of this book? Man, I, I've thought about this a lot, and I have no idea what writing a draft of a book even looks like. <laughs> so that that's where my mind kind okay. of spins out. Well, well, we'll just... Um, I'll, I think I think the first step maybe just uh, just a page and doesn't even have to be a page if you want to do more on each of the scenes that you already have in your oh, head okay. and it's just super rough super fucking rough and then we take a look at that and then we just flesh it out a little bit uh, like two or three passes on that and we would have probably a, a pretty good first draft okay so yeah I think I think we you I think I think you'll move pretty fast yeah I mean I think we have like what what do we say today like 10 12 scenes I don't know at we, least we drew out at least I could probably do one of those a day yeah see and that's because I have them pretty like clear in my mind see I, mean, I did a lot of thinking about it when I was up meditating in Joshua Tree dude that's it, awesome it's pretty solidified that's awesome so it's just I haven't, I haven't gotten the habit of sitting down and typing that, that's all I'm missing dude I, I have a hard time I have a hard time focusing and some, sometimes uh, my brain won't work that way and I can't yeah. go in front of a computer I was like because I know if I'm in front of a computer I'm going to go do some shit I don't it's need to be doing watching and porn exactly yeah. he knows it's too re- easy man it's resistance too easy. It's, <laughs> resistance is strong and Google is easy yeah. and incognito mode and, god uh, damn it and I don't have a wife to watch out for so that's true <laughs> it's a lot easier e- in my world even better uh, <laughs> what time is it we, we are oh well yeah I guess we because I have to do the yoga part Unless, unless Marshall wants to do that part too, oh my I like being a student. It's six oh nine, so we still have some time. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what class is like tonight. Um, I think we might have a new woman joining. One of Libby's friends' moms. Yeah. 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 We're recruiting the soccer moms. To uh-huh. Dude, I, think, I mean, that's the thing. When you know, when you know how much someone would enjoy it or what it could give them, uh, I think you want to. You want to share it? Uh, one of the one of the guys from Libby's school, he trains jujitsu. One of the dads, um, and we've talked a couple of times. And I think he's going to make it this Saturday. So that's awesome. Person to person marketing, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yep. an important uh, figure in this neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, setting people up, nope. improving their lives. I wish. No, but dude, that that's a fun thing to do. It's fun getting rid of people's doubts. Uh, mm. My friend Carl, who's helping me with unlocking the cage. Uh, he was an assistant at Brown. He was the guy to answer the phone when I called the sociology department. Like if someone, dude, if someone negative had answered the phone and wasn't didn't know anything about MMA, like who knows if I would have even done it. But he was super cool. I met him, and he was at that point where he wasn't happy with what he was doing, and he's a photographer, and he's a great photographer. But uh, this kind of like gave him that incentive and said, "Go for it." And uh, luckily, he did, and he didn't fail. So uh, otherwise, he'd be blaming me. I'm like, oh, I should shut the fuck up. <laughs> but, no, anytime, dude. When you 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 can tell when someone uh, has something in them and they want to do more too. So it's like, yeah, why not? Or just give them that opportunity if they if they want it. So if it's there, if I'm able to. So 
Um, I think we all do that. Saving people's lives, Mark. Yep, yep, yep. One at a fucking time. <laughs> I'm glad uh, you're out there saving the world. Yeah, I'm, fuck, <laughs> I'm, I'm such a good guy. God damn it. You're going to have a book. You're so fucking lucky. No. Um, no, oh, my niece. Um she's gonna do one and, and like with them like i expect them you know they could take a long time on this this is something fun for them to uh get started and that way they feel they're they're part of it or whatever but hers will probably turn into something good she wants to do camelot like try not to die in camelot <laughs> i was like i was like it's it's fair game we could do it like that's a cool ass story that's what she loves so that's what i tell everyone is like man what do you love what are you passionate about what do you want to write about yeah. and uh yeah because we can make it any feel any 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 genre, any Dude, style. I could do a try not to die in every city in the world. That'd be, that'd, that'd be, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> Send me down to Rio de Janeiro. I'll yeah. come back a week later with a, a story, a well, script, whatever needs to be done. That, that was one of the places we were thinking. Yeah, um, it's easy yeah. to die there. Yeah, so that'd be a good location. Um, I was trying to think if I have any Brazilian friends to make it a little bit more authentic. Mm. You're pretty white. <laughs> so could be the guy in the story, though. Yeah, um, yeah that, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Um, but I've yeah. also seen a lot of Brazilian TV shows. You know, so. Oh, oh, that, that, <laughs> that, that, that's awesome! No, I think that'd be I think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, oh, but we, I do. All my thoughts are coming back to me now. Just to, so if anyone wants to try the breathing exercise that Marshall did earlier, uh, this is what I shared with the class. It was during this peaceful, relaxing yoga session. Um, I said, okay, now when you're doing this, when you're holding that breath for as long as possible. Okay, taking as much as possible. Now picture, I was like, I picture my son on my chest, and this, I know that the second that I stop breathing, that I have to take a breath, he, he, his breath ends. He's, he's going to die. And so that's the mental game, one of the mental games I play with myself. And the first time I did that, like it lasted like another 8 seconds, 10 seconds. I was able to go deeper. Wow. Um, and I might have cried a little bit, like a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but then I was like, oh, no, I don't. I guess I could turn off my 12.30 pickup Jake alarm. <laughs> no, that's that, that's too dark. I'm... <laughs> too dark. Um, you know what? <laughs> you have to joke about that kind of shit because, dude, that that was that used to be one of my big problems was the fear of something happening to my daughter. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, and that's one reason I didn't even want kids. Because, dude, my my philosophy in life was life fucking sucks. Um, I don't even really want to be in it that much. And if so, if I have something good, it's gonna go to shit. Like mm. that was my. That's the first noble truth of Buddhism. You know really? That? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the Buddha's first teaching out of enlightenment. Was a uh, life is suffering. Oh really? Yeah. Well, that's why I got that. That's one the down. first one. <laughs> but it's not the last one. Oh, like, there's okay. other. There's there's more. Yeah, I, <laughs> no, I feel, there's a more positive. I feel like I moved on a little bit, but yeah. I think that helps. What'd you uh, learn? What What do you think the second truth is? What was the second thing you learned after that? Um, <laughs> life is suffering. It's shit. We Kids d- shouldn't come in. Fuck weed, them. Weed is awesome. Weed is awesome. <laughs> How long have you been smoking weed for? I don't know. Uh, today? Uh, today I was proud of myself. Then it start to like 2.30. <laughs> Usually it's like 9 o'clock. Dude, I feel guilty then. But I was like, it's helping. Um, you do a Joey Diaz style? Just wake up, puff, and drink some coffee with a notebook? No, that's a good idea. If I was single. If I was single, I would. If I didn't have kids, I would. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes uh, those are my best days. If I can wake up like two hours before jujitsu, yeah, and then stretch and meditate for twenty minutes, and then sit outside with tea, a notebook, and a bong, yeah, maybe some headphones. Dude, how many of your friends fucking hate you? <sighs> all the ones in the office, man. Dude, I majored in accounting in college, and all those guys listen to the podcast like in the office. <laughs> like, my, I hope they like it. I don't know. My my buddy, shout uh, out to you guys, love you, but. My, my, <laughs> I don't, I don't want your job. My buddy Glenn always calls me up. He's like, and he'll just say whatever the picture was that I posted. He's like, "You're such a fucking dick." <laughs> he's like, "No." He's like, "Keep it up." He's like, "He's like, but you know I'm jealous as fuck, right?" Yeah. He's like, "Today you couldn't like I put one like I couldn't decide if I want to play guitar or do yoga or just, <laughs> like, that's usually the the main problem." Today today's big issue was uh, fuck I haven't even done it yet, so I still have this ahead of me today. Um, I have to make the bed. I did the laundry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And now I have to, dude. You have to fold the clothes. You have to put them back on the bed. Uh, yeah, and I found out too. If you don't make it right, it doesn't count, and that makes it even worse. Um, and for pillows, you have to make sure to put the right pillowcases on the right pillows, or it's all wrong. Um, so I'm learning, but yeah, you're growing up, man. Yeah, yeah, I'm growing up, <laughs> doing my job. Um, That's cool. That's inspiring, man. It's good to know that uh, people are out there like you. 
Because, dude, when I was in college, man, like, no joke, I, I was part of the accounting society at the University of San Diego, and they, we would have meetings where, like, my joke at the time was that any sentence they have, you could put in, there's an unspoken, do this or you will be poor. That's what you could say at the end of all of them. They're like, guys, um, EY is going to be on campus tomorrow, wear your suits. Mm-hmm. Or you're gonna be poor. Like that's yeah. how they do it at the end of every single one. Like guys, there's a golf thing. You're gonna want to be there. Because if not, you're gonna be poor. Was that a driving factor? Like, is that why you were going into accounting? No, man. That's what drove me out of it. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, like because I I went into it with pretty. Um, I went into it very naive. Mm. I went into it because the University of San Diego, a place I chose for no apparent reason. Just party? A, a nice school. Not oh, even, that's man. not even the party one, huh? Yeah, San Diego State's the party one. And one thing that I remember in high school is we had a teacher tell us that every school's a party school. So that wasn't even a consideration. Yeah. I was like, I don't need the craziest. Like, I'm not this big party guy. Like, there's alcohol everywhere. That's Whatever. True. Not, it wasn't really a concern. I don't know why. I didn't really choose it for good reason. My cousin went there and I visited once and <laughs> three places I applied. And then when it came time to choose a major, man, my, my buddy was doing accounting and he talked me into it. And I was like, okay, at least I'll have classes with him. And then I just stuck with it. My dad thought it sounded good. My dad's been in an office for, I don't know how long now, 35 years. Is he happy? Or is that part of why he's maybe not so happy? <laughs> it, it's hard to say. Because I don't yeah. know what he'd be like if he didn't do that. Right. I mean, he has money. Um, maybe if he didn't have this job, he would be have right. more free time but less money. Maybe that would give him the same amount of problems. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah. I, I, I tried. I went on the accounting path. I had jobs. I had internships. I did taxes one season. I sat at the Jack in the Box corporate headquarters the next season. I sat in their massage chairs about an hour a day. Yeah, not a bad deal. An hour out of the four hours I was there, whatever it was. And then, But then I started taking uh, philosophy classes, and uh, that fucked me up. I, I spent uh, two years in college trying to connect the nice Buddhist ideas I was learning in one class with the crazy business concepts I was learning the other three. And a lot of times it, you can connect them. But the further I went into accounting, the less connection there was. To the point that my senior year, I had a teacher explain two different scenarios of like, what deal would you take in a business scenario? It's very specific. But one thing he, he concluded it with, why would you ever do something that makes you less money? Mm-hmm. Why would you, why is there ever any one saying there's no other reasons. And I was learning this philosophy class, there's always 10,000 ways to do everything. That's what I kept thinking. But accounting's so specific, and it's such like a, an ingrained thing that there's very little wiggle room. So when I got an accounting job last year, that was the first like, real job I had. Like, out of college, I, I went straight to Asia and then had that teaching job, and then came back and got this real accounting job. And there's just no wiggle room in it. But I know, I, I believe so firmly that in every situation, there's 10,000 ways to do everything. Like, think of jujitsu, man. Like, there's, if someone can't, comes to you and says, no, there's only one way to do this, you'd laugh. Like, like yeah. what the fuck are you talking about, man? There's not only one way. But, 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 but the, the counting is more complicated is the laws involved. I, I was that, that's say, what it is. Like, that, say, that's, the re- that's what's holding it in the place. It's there for a good reason. <laughs> I, I, was gonna say, I was like, yeah. I was like, if an accountant tells me that there's 10,000 ways to file my... Uh... My taxes, but like, there are, oh, man. Well, yeah, here's yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Here's one that I learned on the job that I'll tell everybody. I don't know if this is true anymore. Tax laws change all, all the time. But what she would have me do is make up a fake list of donations that someone could have done for under five hundred dollars. The distinction mm-hmm. being that it says in clear print the IRS does not check for donations under five hundred dollars. <laughs> and I don't. Maybe that's changed. It's been a couple years. Yeah, I don't think they check. Under five hundred. So if you you ever, so I'm gonna look into it this year. I'm planning on donating about four hundred and eighty dollars worth of socks. That's smart. And <laughs> write it on a piece of paper, and then that's proof. Um, I like the way you. So think. I mean, there are ways, man. That's always that's at least one. <laughs> now, are you? Um, so is that career path completely done? Like, or I is mean, that something you would do on the side, or like, what do you? I always keep it open. I got. I, I know a couple ways to do it. I know an accountant who I met at the Mad Monk Tea Shop, the place I was talking to you earlier about, the place I learned all about tea. The accountant for there, she used to teach meditation there. She's uh, she does tax returns, and she lives in a tiny house in, excuse me, in uh, Northern California in the woods. Mm. Like she lives in a solar powered tiny house, and just like I, I assume makes as much money as she wants. I yeah. Mean, 
she's just turning down clients or just not accepting the crazy one. She, she has that kind of power, whatever amount of money that equals, I don't really know, mm-hmm. but exactly as much as she wants. And so I hold that out as like a possibility, but I don't know, man, it, it, it's hard to find the, the, the heart in it. You mm-hmm. know? And I think she has, like, she really likes her clients and they're all friends. Um, but that's a hard thing to develop. I think that took a while. And if you enjoy that kind of work too, like I, I like numbers. So I'm like, maybe I would enjoy it a little bit, but I don't, I don't like know, sitting man. down and doing shit on Excel yeah. or whatever you use. Yeah. And the, just being inside all day freaked me out too. Yeah. Like the hours of, of a office job are insane to me. Like they don't make any sense. I kept trying to rationalize that when I was in the office all day. I'm like, cause we're, we're in Southern California, man. Like the most beautiful place in the whole world. And office jobs keep you inside during the exact most beautiful times. And one thing, this is when I knew everyone in the office was crazy. Because it rained one day, and they're inside complaining. When, like, there's no windows, there's no, like, there's no leaks in the ceiling. Like, it's the exact same as any other day, but they're inside complaining about the weather they can't see. Like, oh my god. Like, not only are we blocked from it, but we're, we're turning crazy. And the, the food there is insane, man. Every office I've been in is just, like, junk food. Which, like, I, I spent too much time, like, working out jujitsu and um, fucking meditation, man. You, you feel exactly how food impacts your brain. Like, mm-hmm. it, it's so crazy. Like, the diet on a meditation retreat is all vegetarian for a reason. Like, this last one, man, it was 10 days of just, like, um, all vegetarian, very low sugar, one day they brought us cookies and it was like the best day of my life. And the next day there was hot apple cider and it was like the greatest. And then three more days of not much. And then as soon as I got out, I ate an entire big thing of Mike and Ike's. Ooh. After <laughs> and so I came back and I immediately lost, I don't 13% of the mental energy and clarity I'd gained over those 10 days. Just immediately. And then it was the holiday season, man, and my dad had received um, so many amazing uh, desserts. There's there bars of the best chocolate I've ever had in my life, and there's all these other things. It was like it was an abnormal thing that he got this, and I was downhill from there, man. It's, it's so clear to me, like the relationship between food and um, mental process. But that being said, I, I'm not like good about following it. I just watch it happen. Dude, that's important. That's something I don't really think much about. Yeah, I should. But, yeah, man. I, I don't know if you ever had this experience, but um, I, I, I got in the habit of uh, 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 spinach protein shakes. I'd have one about once a day, and it's so healthy. And then I got off of it for whatever the fuck reason. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Traveling, like, it's almost impossible. Um, a lot of reasons that I've been off in the past. But anyway, I was off for about five days, just not eating well. Like, I ate really into fast food burgers. That's the only thing I'm really into. Mm-hmm. And then I came back to the spinach on that fifth day, and as soon as I had it in my stomach, it's like my brain came alive. Like, it, an, an immediate increase and in just, like, clear thinking for mm-hmm. the first time, at least that day. You That's know? cool. Yeah, it's just it's it's very uh, it's fun to watch, and tea helps too, man. No, dude, I, that's uh that's awesome. So, the, I gave you a little bit of something with uh, encouraging you to write, and you gave me this new healthier. Uh, I'm gonna start drinking a lot of that green tea, and uh, <laughs> the green tea you already had in your kitchen <laughs> that, that, that I that I never touched. I totally forgot it was there. The great matcha. Yeah, I'll, I'll even give you a little baggie of it. Ten bucks. The sketchiest looking bag of my life. Yeah. <laughs> bag of green powder. <laughs> Yeah, I'm into uh, that. Appreciate it, man. Thank no, you. No, and uh, and you're teaching tonight, so that's dope. <laughs> um, awesome. We probably should get going because I guess we got to uh, get ready for class awesome, and man. figure well, all that. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, no, thank you for uh, coming over. I'm excited about the book. Um, yeah, I think we could get that shit done this year. I think we can release it. Another try not to die. Um, at the end of every podcast, I put out a story. I think I just have one left. I don't know which one it is, uh, but I think it's from, well, so this is off of Twisted Reunion. Uh, you get the whole audio book on Audible, um, and if you bought the ebook, you get it super cheap. I think it's $1.99 for the audio book. Wow. Uh, this, yeah, great deal, right? Go get it now. Um, <laughs> this short story, fuck, I don't know what it is, so we're just going to surprise you. I don't know if it'll be, <laughs> I don't know if it'll, Marshall will have it on his, um, and check out his podcast. What, what's your podcast again? Tales of Macaque Podcast. Awesome. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you guys are interested in the story, and if he doesn't put it on because he's a dick, 
uh, then just go to Unlocking Podcast, <laughs> and it will be at the end of that. I don't know what it is, but hopefully you guys will enjoy it. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Bye. Shooting flies. The fly wouldn't sit still. Raymond held his breath, pressed his eye to the viewfinder, and tried not to move. Sweat beads rolled down his forehead, but he couldn't risk wiping them and scaring the skittish thing off again. Gina had been waiting for hours. The hunk of meat was almost dried out. This was it. He had to get the shot. He promised her perfection. But all he had to show were the dozen flawed photographs drying on the line. Blurred wings and bad light. Okay. There you go, he whispered. The fly's six little legs finally landed on the slab of flesh. Sadly, not a single photoreceptor was in view, just a giant shot of the fly's ass. Raymond waited for it to move. Without the eyes, what the hell was the point? He stood perfectly still and tried to will it with his mind, but the fly refused to turn around. Slowly, Raymond slid his feet across the floor, tried to ignore his aching old man's knees. He kept his finger on the shutter release as he moved the viewfinder up along the arch of its swollen abdomen to the thorax, and almost to the head, when suddenly another fly began to circle. No, get away, Raymond whispered. You've had your chance. An enormous eye crept into the frame. Finally, Raymond thought. He just had to maneuver around the table's edge, and he'd have the full face in view. The light stand was precariously close. But Raymond stepped over it and held the shot. The fly began to feast. Just an inch to the left, and Raymond would have his angle. His foot clipped the light. His finger mashed the release, but the fly was already in the air. God damn it! Raymond threw the camera at the wall but the strap caught it at the back of his neck. The Nikon banged against his chest. He closed his eyes. A dozen buzzing taunts echoed in his ears. What made him think he could pull this off? It took him eighteen months just to talk to Gina. Whenever Raymond heard her voice in the office, even if she was simply complaining about the copier, his stomach would twist in knots. He went to great lengths to avoid her cubicle at least when she was in it. He hadn't even stepped foot in the sales department in over a year. In fact, he'd go out the back, walk around the building, and come in the side entrance just to go to the bathroom. Only in his dreams did he ever think he'd get a date with her. And now she was sitting in his kitchen, waiting for him to finish. And he was blowing it. Raymond tried to breathe. All he needed was one good shot. That perfect moment. The delicate shadows, his careful composition, an emotionless subject in tandem. And he'd capture a beauty, a depth never before attributed to the common housefly. Gina would be so impressed by his brilliance, so stunned by his sensitivity, she wouldn't be able to speak. But that'd be okay. He'd just kiss her and never mention he'd only bought his first camera six months ago. It was the day after he saw her carrying a black-and-white photography book. Gina had told one of the office girls her dad had sent it as a present for her promotion. The cover was a picture of a little boy blowing a dandelion. Gina thought it was so cute. I guess so, Raymond said, imagining himself as he sat casually on the edge of the desk and picked up her mug of pens. What do you mean you guess so? It's cute. Sure, if you like generic. Oh, I didn't realize you were an expert. I, I dabble. She'd tried to pretend she wasn't intrigued. He'd dismissively tap on the book's cover. It just doesn't say anything. I mean, if you're going to take a picture, it should provoke something. Gina would cock her head not think once about Raymond being twice her age. Aren't you in accounting? Just until I save up enough to spend a year in Naples. He'd stand up and start to walk away when she'd call out, 
I'd love to see your work. Maybe I could even model for you? That was the fantasy. So far from the truth. Gina was way too beautiful and glamorous for a bumbling dipshit like Raymond. Still, he kept snapping pictures. Actually getting a few decent angles of the city skyline and an action shot of two homeless guys racing shopping carts in an alley. Raymond kept the photos in a manila folder, which he carried everywhere, waiting for the perfect opportunity to accidentally let them fall out in front of Gina. She'd pick them up, and he'd ask her opinion. Finally, one afternoon, he mustered up the courage to follow her into the break room. As he prepared coffee he didn't really want, Gina started frantically swatting at a fly. It landed on the wall and Raymond, panicked and amped with adrenaline, squished it with his manila folder. When he pulled away, the splattered bits of fly on the wall looked like a burst of fireworks. Gina screamed, No! Oh my God! Why did you do that? What? I, I thought... No, I was trying to shoo it. What? Shoo it. Raymond noticed the opened window and he was suddenly the little kid who disgusted his poor old mother. I'm, I'm sorry, he said. It's a living creature. She walked up to the stain. Oh. She said it like she'd just watched a fluffy puppy's eyeball fall out. Raymond mumbled an apology and slunk back to his desk, where he berated himself until the shame started to turn him on which made him feel even more like a freak. He looked for a new job, even went on an interview, but no one was looking to hire an old dog with new tricks. So he tried to avoid thoughts of Gina at all costs. He'd turn up his headphones when he heard her in the office. He no longer stood by the water cooler at that awkward angle so he could watch her wait for the bus. He didn't drive anywhere near her apartment. The photography was all that remained of his infatuation. Raymond spent every second of free time taking pictures. Maybe his talent would one day outshine his dumb face. It wasn't impossible. This was a woman whose heart was so big she even loved a filthy little fly. But time was running out. Raymond hadn't snapped anything good enough to even hang on a refrigerator, and Gina wasn't going to be here forever. Raymond jabbed his thumb into the meat. He dug until a little pocket of pink flesh was exposed. Then he sat back on the stool and watched as one of the flies took notice. There you go, he said. But the fly swooped back and headed towards the corner. Raymond wondered if he should just get a can of Raid. He could arrange their lifeless bodies on the meat precisely the way he wanted. But that wouldn't be fair to Gina. She deserved more than some cheap lie. Chuckles let out a low growl behind the bedroom door. Raymond realized he hadn't fed him dinner. The smell of meat had to be driving him crazy. Raymond had locked him in the bedroom because Gina had a thing about dogs licking her. He considered letting Gina in the studio with him, but he couldn't work with someone watching, judging every move. Gina probably wouldn't be critical, but it was better this way. He was already panicking and sweating. He just hoped she would stick around a little longer. If she left before he finished, he didn't know what he would do. Maybe he should check on her? He needed a fresh piece of meat anyway. This was the third piece he'd had to toss out, and of course the flies swarmed the moment it thunked in the bin. Raymond wiped his hands on his shirt and opened the door. Chuckles jumped against it, his claws scratching. Cut that out or you're not getting dinner. Raymond tried to sound tough, but he couldn't help smiling as Chuckles wagged his tail across the carpet. Raymond knelt down and let Chuckles lick his fingers. A tiny sliver of bone fell off Raymond's shirt, and Chuckles snarfed it down in one bite. Be careful. You don't want to choke, silly. Chuckles' mouth was stained red with meat juice. Raymond shook his head and told Chuckles to stay. He didn't need Gina freaking out from the dog bounding in and slobbering all over her. Raymond slipped into the kitchen where Gina sat at the table. 
Chuckles' whimpers seeped under the door as Raymond headed for the fridge. Hey there, beautiful. He brought out two energy drinks and said, I think this will be my best work yet. Trust me, you're going to love it. He popped the tab on one of the cans and took a long pull. I know you're upset I'm not finished yet. But there's no reason to cry. I'll be done soon, I promise. Raymond downed the rest of his drink and opened the second one. But I do need a new piece. Gina tried to scream, but the dirty dish towel muffled her cries. Raymond reached down and grabbed the power saw under the table. Her open stumps were beginning to fester. A few flies dripped in the soft, gooey tendrils. They must have snuck in through the vent. Raymond grabbed her remaining arm. Gina tried to pull away, but the restraints kept her in place. Hey, it's okay, he said. I promise. Fourth time's a charm. <laughs>